Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where, let's face it, we get the world's most awesome folks. Today, we got Bruce Friedrich on the program. Bruce, thanks for coming. I'm delighted to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me. So, Bruce, Good Food Institute, are you a vegetarian? What's the story? Uh, I am a vegetarian. I've actually been a vegan for more than 30 years, but uh, the Good Food Institute is not focused on vegetarians or vegans. We're not a vegetarian or a vegan advocacy organization. Uh, we're focused on everybody who eats. So instead of trying to convince people to change how they think about food, uh, we're changing the food. Which is definitely the way to do it, because if you have to get people to change, that's incredibly challenging. Uh, yes, yeah, it is. Um, although changing the food is incredibly challenging too. But basically, uh, at GFI, we have looked at you know the two big questions in food are how we're going to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050, and what are we going to do about climate change? And industrial animal agriculture uh, is a big problem from both of those vantages. Industrial animal agriculture is an extremely inefficient way of producing calories. Uh, and it packs a massive climate change wallop. Uh, but rather than trying to convince people to eat less meat, eggs, and dairy, uh, we can produce meat from plants and we can grow it directly from cells so we can remove a lot of the inefficiency. Um, so too with dairy and eggs, we can produce those things through fermentation, no animals required, um, or we can biomimic animal proteins with plants. So plant-based milk, plant-based eggs, plant-based meat, uh, and then using cellular agriculture to produce actual dairy and egg proteins and actual meat, uh, but without all the inefficiencies involved in live, raising live animals. Or suffering. Basically, eat the cake and have it too, and get rid of the farts while we're doing it, which apparently is the big problem with climate change, all of the methane. Um, that's, a, that's a big part of it. I mean, it, it's also just the, the total inefficiency. So um, chicken is the most efficient meat at turning crops uh, into meat. And yet the vast majority of the calories that you feed to a chicken, the chicken expends simply existing. Um, just like you and I, the vast, like, you know, probably all of the calories we eat now don't go into weight gain. Uh, they go into just powering our bodies. So if you want to raise a chicken to slaughter weight, it takes nine calories into the chicken to get one calorie back out in the form of meat. That means nine times as much land, nine times as much water, nine times as much pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. Um, and that's not all. Then you're shipping all of those crops to a feed mill and you're operating a feed mill. Then you are shipping the feed to the farm and you're operating the farm. Then you're shipping the animals to the slaughterhouse and you're operating the slaughterhouse. You add up all of that inefficiency um, and the CO2 impact, not just the methane impact, um, is pretty huge. I want to get back to that for a sec, but I saw a recent article and I wanted to get your take on it. It was researchers, I want to say Australia or New Zealand, found some algae that was cutting down uh, cow farts by 99%. And I don't know if you heard about it or if you had any deeper insight. Um, I mean, there are, you, you see sort of a constant stream of let's make the meat industry less harmful. Um, and you can certainly mitigate the adverse climate impact of the meat industry in a wide variety of ways. Um, so Livestock's Long Shadow from 2006 is, is essentially a, a 400 page report from the United Nations. Um, and what that report says is that animal agriculture, no matter what environmental problem you look at, from the smallest and most local to the largest and most global uh, industrial animal agriculture is one of the top three causes. And on climate change, uh, more climate change is caused by animal agriculture than by all forms of transportation combined. So that's usually, when you hear about livestock's long shadow, that's you know what you hear. Uh, but the actual point of livestock's long shadow was not, uh, let's figure out how to stop raising animals for food. The point was, let's figure out how to make things slightly less bad. Um, at GFI, we, you know, slightly less bad is, is better than, you know, more bad. Uh, but if we can remove animals from the production system altogether, uh, we don't have to worry about the methane. If there are no live animals, it's zero methane. Um, and then nitrous oxide from manure decomposition is about a 300 times more potent uh, than CO2. We can get rid of all of that. Um, and then, of course, just the basic inefficiency of raising animals to slaughter them. So probably all of your listeners are concerned about food waste, and we should be concerned about food waste, something like 40 percent of all of the food that's produced globally ends up being thrown away. 
But remember, um, chickens, you know, nine calories in for one calorie back out, that's essentially 800% food waste um, just in the physiology of the chicken. And again, chickens are the most efficient meat at turning crops into meat. So um, sure, the half measures are better than not the half measures, but let's you know, solve the entire problem. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, don't half ass it. So, we have a lot of different approaches for this. There's the plant based meats. There's the soy's. There's lab grown meat. There's even the cricket approach. What are you seeing as the most promising things happening today? Yeah, I mean, I, one one thing just to toss out in terms of nomenclature um, is lab grown meat. Uh, sounds kind of scary to people, and it's not lab grown meat any more than you know Cheerios are lab grown Cheerios. Um, so all processed food starts in a food lab. Um, heck, even the, the big meat companies uh, have food labs in which they are uh, manipulating their meat and figuring out how to uh, allow it to preserve for as long as possible and doing various other things. Um, at production scale, um, meat grown directly from cells, which we generally refer to as clean meat or cultivated meat or cultured meat, um, it will be produced in a factory, uh, and that factory will look an awful lot like a brewery. Um, so, you know, it's not, uh, you know, there, there's no lab uh, past the sort of initial development stages. Um, there's a tremendous amount of exciting uh, stuff happening at the moment in both the plant based on both the plant based side um, as well as the um, cultured clean side. So, uh, literally dozens of companies who are growing meat directly from cells. Um, lots of companies figuring out how to biomimic meat with plants. Um, a lot of very interesting and exciting work happening um, on dairy alternatives, on egg alternatives, uh, both fermenting dairy proteins without animals um, and biomimicking dairy proteins with plants. It's a, a very, this, this entire industry is very, very exciting. Um, and the plant-based side of things, uh, plant-based foods are growing very, very quickly. Um, something like 35%, I think, over the last couple of years, um, even as the overall food sector has grown just a few percent. And what does that look like going forward? When do we hit that tipping point where we're at the inversion? I've got to think if we get to the point of price parity, most people are going to be like, do I want to eat the cow that got shot in the head or had a shitty life? Or am I going to eat the, am I going to eat the clean meat burger? I want to believe most people are going to go to that. But when do we start to get to that price parity point? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the plant-based products, we're going to get to price parity a little bit more quickly. Um, and we're already there in terms of taste. Um, so uh, anybody who has not yet had the Impossible Whopper um, should uh, hit pause on this po podcast, find your nearest Burger King, and go eat an Impossible Whopper and uh, bring all of your friends and family. Um, I would also encourage people, if you want to just spend a, a one minute uh, in an amusing way, um, Google Impossible Whopper commercial. It's pretty great. Um, and it's actual people who are like Whopper devotees um, eating the Impossible Whopper. And they're kind of flabbergasted that the Impossible Whopper is not actually beef. What's it made uh, of? Uh, it's made of soy. So it's uh, Impossible Foods, which is Pat Brown's company uh, from the Bay Area, uh, has made the Impossible Burger. Um, and now they have the Impossible Whopper at Burger King. And it's really, it's really, um, meat eaters cannot tell the difference um, and the environmental impact. So Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, two plant-based meat companies, um, probably the two most successful so far, they got the United Nations Champions of the Earth Award uh, for creating plant-based burgers that meat eaters want to eat. Uh, so taste the same or better, which is half the equation. Um, and that have uh, much less of an adverse impact on especially the climate, but also much less land use, much less water use, much less energy use. It's just a, a much better alternative. Um, and it's not just for vegetarians and flexitarians and people who are trying to cut back on their uh, meat intake. It's for everybody. I'm big on the movement, but I'm actually very anti-soy because it's, an, it's a phytoestrogen, essentially. So if you eat a lot of it, you can boost your estrogen levels, which is great for women and not so great for guys. What are the other plant-based approaches? Yeah, so I'm not a soy expert, um, but I know that the American Diet, well, I guess it's called the, uh, the American Dietetic Association is now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, and they have some fact sheets on soy. Um, their argument as dietitians is that in fact, um, soy is good for everyone. 
um, and certainly soy consumption in Asia um, has been extremely high for a very long time, um, and they do not have you know, more effeminate men. Um, I eat an awful lot of soy, um, and I know a lot of other people who eat an awful lot of soy, and I don't, I don't, think, uh, I don't think we have uh, higher than normal estrogen levels. So you might want to dive into the science on that. But um, the Beyond Burger, which you can get at Carl's Jr. Um, and TGI Fridays, um, those I think are the two main places that have the Beyond Burger. If you're in New York City, you can get uh, Beyond Sausage um, at Dunkin' Donuts, and uh, you can get the Beyond Sausage and the Beyond Beef uh, at most grocery stores, probably all grocery stores. Um, and that's made of pea protein. Um, I think both the Beyond Sausage and the Beyond Burger um, is from pea protein. Uh, and you're going to see more and more uh, of these plant-based alternatives made from kind of the entire range of the, the legume kingdom. Um, you can use lentils and chickpeas and lupin and canola, um, pretty much any, any legume. Um, you, can, you can process it into plant-based meat. Uh, you do need food scientists and meat scientists and others to make sure that you get the taste and the texture exactly right. Uh, but Impossible and Beyond are there, um, and they're there with a variety of, of different uh, different legumes. And I think you're going to see more and more different legumes. If you had to bet on just one type of clean meat going forward, would it be the lab or brewery grown? Would it be plant-based? Would it be possibly something else? Um, I think probably I think probably cultivated meat, so meat grown directly from cells. And um, so I heard Josh Tetrick from Just um, on the um, Business for Good podcast uh, a week or two ago, and he was asked by the host Paul Shapiro um, basically this question, and I really liked his answer. He said, um, "If McDonald's is going to have two products." Um, in 10 years. You can imagine them having a plant-based burger um, and a conventional animal-based burger. Uh, but if our goal is actually to transform the meat industry to a new way of, of, of producing meat, um, and that is our goal, our goal is that, that all meat is produced either from plants um, or grown directly from cells. Um, if McDonald's is going to have one product in 10 years, which do you think it's going to be? Seems more likely uh, that it's going to be meat grown directly from cells rather than meat biomimicked with plants. That struck me as a pretty convincing argument. Um, you know, the, the reverse, the flip of that, though, is that plant-based meat is here now. Uh, plant-based meat has a jump um, in terms of production um, and just timelines um, on meat grown directly from cells. But um, over time, my hunch is that you will see both um, I don't know in what proportion, but I do think there's something uh, innate in human beings. Like a lot of people just want to eat actual animal meat, uh, but they eat meat despite how it's produced, not because of how it's produced. If we can grow it directly from cells and once it costs the same or less, um, I think everybody switches over. Which would also imply if they eat it despite how it's produced, they'll probably eat even more of it. If we were going to kind of play the devil's advocate argument out. Right. Oh yeah, no, I think that's I think that's probably true. Um, so yes, if your if your primary concern is heart disease and cancer, um, we will you know we'll, we'll probably see more uh, self inflicted wounds from meat consumption. I guess the plant based meat could could turn that back if we do get to a point at which the plant well the plant based meat already tastes the same with the burgers. Um, so as plant based meat, we get to a point at which it tastes the same or better and costs the same or less. Uh, the question is. Um, yeah, I think I think if you add up plant-based meat and cultivated meat, the number will probably be greater than it is now. Um, and if it turns out that the cultivated meat, meat grown directly from cells that's biologically identical to animal meat, um, if it turns out that that number uh, by itself is greater than the number now, uh, then you know meat-related um, health ailments could actually go up. Uh, but the environment will be significantly better off. Um, we'll be able to feed more people. Uh, we will have no antibiotic resistance um, that comes about as a result of feeding antibiotics to farm animals, uh, so still a ton of benefits. I think a lot of the negative consequences of eating meat are actually associated with what you eat meat alongside with. So for instance, almost all, if not all, of the studies have been epidemi epidemiology studies. So you're taking someone who's 
a, you're taking basically a healthy, fit vegetarian who's working out versus an average American who's eating burgers. The the bread is actually the problem, but that's that's more for science to get into. But I would I would be willing to bet that those numbers come down, if not improve for for meat based options, just because you have a lot less inflammation. But that's a that's a whole other topic. Talk to me about the future of not just animal agriculture, but agriculture specifically, as we start having more plant-based meats that takes up more space in terms of needing to grow more soy. Do you see any issues in terms of mass industrial scale farming? So monoculture crops, et cetera. Well, it's actually the opposite of that. So, um, the Amazon, oh, the animals don't have to eat then you're right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, more than 90 percent of soy is fed to farm animals. Uh, Greenpeace did this uh, amazing um, demonstration in the Amazon rainforest, the, the largest banner um, in world history. And it said KFC colon Amazon criminal uh, because the rainforest was being chopped, chopped down. Everything OK there? It sounds like we, they're coming for you. They just dropped a bomb. Uh, it was lightning, and I think it uh, I think it hit fairly fairly close. But um, yeah, that was. Uh, we've also had a couple of uh, power flashes in the course of <laughs> this interview. Our power has gone flickered off and then flickered back on. But um, it doesn't seem like it's affected our connection, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, technology. It's 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 great. Sometimes it's terrible, and sometimes you're just unexpectedly awesome. So continue on the unexpectedly awesome and awfulness of taking down the rainforest. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it goes back to um, chicken it requires nine calories in to get one calorie back out. Um, pork and beef require even more calories in to get one calorie back out. Um, if we stop with that inefficiency, we can actually stop monocropping, mono you know, soy, wheat and corn. And we can move toward growing lentils and chickpeas and lupin um, and other crops. Um, we can dump significantly fewer pesticide, pesticides on them. Um, we can allow farmers <clears throat> to stop with the sort of go big or get out uh, mantra that currently uh, dictates what farming looks like. Do you think, what, what does that future of farming look like? Because this is one thing I'm not so sure about. If we go to a, if we go to a clean meat type setup, essentially, I mean, we don't have to call it lab grown, but it's easier to say lab grown if everything's clean meat. So if we go to a lab grown type future, then the economies of scale would be, in theory, so enormous that it would only be big meat players playing. Um, I mean, I think it'll be, I think it will be analogous to what happens with uh, beer now. So certainly, um, you know, you will have your, your Budweiser's and your Heineken's. So you'll have your mass, you know, or your Tyson Foods and your JBS. Um, in our scenario, Tyson and JBS continue to produce meat. They just grow it from cells um, or biomimic it with plants instead of uh, the current production systems. Um, but you will still have the smaller producers. So you'll have your sort of, um, I mean, you can literally um, imagine your friendly neighborhood meat brewery um, that is literally um, creating the meat. And what, look, you know, what looks like a, a brewery now, I mean, that's what, that's what meat production is gonna look like. Um, and these places can be live streaming the production process, you know, live on the internet in real time, uh, which will be obviously um, significantly more palatable to people uh, than what you would see if you were watching meat production today. Much less likely to get salmonella as well. <clears throat> oh yeah, I mean the, the food uh, the food safety. I mean there there are so many benefits to this, and, and yes, food safety is certainly one of them. I mean, um, right now tens of millions of people get sick from contaminated meat every single year. Tens of thousands of people just in the U.S. Um, end up hospitalized, um, and more than a thousand die. And uh, it will be a tiny fraction of that, you know, very, very close to zero from contaminated meat if you're growing it directly from cells or you're producing it uh, from plants. GMO is incredibly charged. Where do you fall on this? And I'm curious to see not just you, but the people around you. Um, uh, I think just like, just like everywhere else, um, there is a wide variety of opinion on GMOs. Um, and if you look at Beyond Meat, uh, they talk about being very proudly uh, GMO free, um, and you look at Impossible Foods, and they talk about being very proudly uh, GMI, GMO soy from uh, the U.S. Midwest. So, um, yeah, with G GFI the, as an organization does not have a position on GMOs, uh, but we certainly are are pro Impossible and Impossible uses GMOs. Sounds like the gods of meat are trying to smite you. Would you eat a Would you eat a lab grown burger? 
Um, I have had uh, meat grown directly from cells. Uh, so I've had clean meat on multiple occasions and would enthusiastically uh, eat a lab-grown burger uh, once the price points, price points come down sufficiently. I've talked to some vegetarians that say no. What do you think about that mental process? Um, I mean, I, I don't care what vegetarians eat. Um, I don't think, uh, I mean, I, I would enthusiastically um, eat clean meat, uh, but it's not for vegetarians. If people are happily vegetarian, um, they can stay happily vegetarian. And uh, the fact that they would not eat uh, cultivated meat is, uh, you know, totally irrelevant. So I want a banana flavored burger. What do you think about some of the edits that we're getting onto the cutting edge of being able to do where we're headed? What's some of the interesting stuff? Well, I think you would, I think you are a rarity. I don't, uh, I don't actually want a banana flavored burger, but well, actually if you had a, if you had a banana flavored burger and you put peanut butter on it, that would be something. Couldn't you just put uh, slice some bananas? Um, you you and, could, but you know where I'm going with this. Adding the adding the interesting flavors into food. Yeah, no, um, I think that that might be a little bit too interesting, uh, Matt. But um, I mean, I, I think right now the the goal is. I mean, some people talk about um, with the uh, clean meat, so meat grown directly from cells. Uh, the two sort of pioneers of the technology um, are both medical doctors. Uh, one of them is Uma Valetti who is a cardiologist who trained at Mayo. Uh, the other one um, was a medical doctor who was uh, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, Mark Post. Um, Dr. Valetti founded Memphis Meats, Dr. Post founded Bosa Meat, um, and both of them have talked about the ability to both, um, as they are creating their meats, um, to make them, to, to basically ramp up the parts of meat that are particularly nutritious and to ramp down uh, the parts of meat that are, you know, cancer causing or the saturated fat, which uh, leads to um, heart disease and that sort of thing. Um, at GFI, we're pretty um, firmly in the camp of if somebody wants to eat meat, let them eat meat and let's just cr not create healthy meat. Let's just create meat. And if somebody wants a healthier product, they can eat plant based meat um, or they can eat beans and rice. So um, people eat a tremendous amount of meat right now. What we need to do is give them exactly what they want, uh, but produce it um, in a way that's not so harmful for the environment, not so harmful for food security, doesn't require so much water, doesn't require antibiotics. Like the harms of industrial animal agriculture, that's what we should be focused on, um, rather than sort of tweaking things to create products that, at least right now, uh, nobody wants. Have the cake and eat it too. So you were one of the first nonprofits to go through YC. What was that like? Um, it was great. It was great. And um, I don't know if we were one of the first. I, I, mean, I, might be, I might be wrong on that, but I know very few have gone through. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, so obviously YC, Y Combinator, um, their model is that they take equity in startups that they are enthusiastic about. Um, and we don't have any equity to give because we are a nonprofit. So um, I think probably, I don't know when they started it, but I think like four or five years ago, um, they started um, accepting nonprofits that they were enthusiastic about, nonprofits that they thought were particularly innovative um, and were going to, were really focused on metrics and results and impact. Um, and GFI was, was, uh, came out of the effective altruism, uh, came out of the effective altruism concept. So um, making sure that we have a coherent strategic plan, making sure that we have objectives, key results, and actions that line up with our objectives and key results, like all of that um, is dialed into how we operate. Um, so we made a lot of sense for, for Y Combinator. And um, yeah, with all of the nonprofits, they just give the nonprofit $100,000 um, and allow you to go through their program um, and learn all of the things that the startups learn when they go through the program. You also end up um, hooked into their network, uh, which, is, uh, which is also pretty great. How do you think you approach this different than most nonprofit founders, and then dive into the effective altruism movement for people who aren't familiar. Um, so, I mean, uh, so I'll, I'll sort of answer both of those simultaneously. So what happens um, with nonprofits, with charities for the most part, um, it's pretty impossible for a charity to go out of business um, if they have somebody at the helm um, who has a little bit of, of charisma and or if they have um, a mailing list. So there are just a lot of charities that have been around for decades 
and aren't really doing that much good in the world anymore, uh, but they have a mailing list. And people do not evaluate charities in the same way that they evaluate buying a car um, or a mattress even. Like it's uh, if the charity is working on something that tugs at your heartstrings um, and they can frame that thing um, in a way that makes sense to you, um, people will write a check. And oftentimes people will write, you know, pretty big checks without asking the charity to explain what its strategic plan is, without the charity um, actually, like some charities will send an annual report and you read through the annual report and it sounds really good and it sounds, you know, like, wow, this charity is fantastic. But if you actually think, like, what has this charity done for the cause that it purports to be working for? What is different now uh, from what happened a year ago? And how much did the charity spend to make that happen? Um, the results can oftentimes be pretty paltry. So um, Princeton bioethicist Peter Singer um, started challenging both philanthropists and charities um, to operate you know, more like businesses uh, in terms of setting goals, um, having metrics, uh, producing strategic plans, producing impact reports, that sort of thing. Um, and the questions of effective altruism are, how important is the issue? How tractable is the issue? So like a lot of charities are working on things um, where their likelihood of success is really, really low. Um, so you might be excited about the fact that, you know, this thing needs to happen and the charity's devoting resources to it, um, but they're not actually gonna make change, uh, in which case, like, what's the point of spending millions of dollars on that? Um, so it's important, tractable, and neglected, uh, which is to say, you know, are there like 30 different charities working on it? Um, and, and 30 different charities working on it might be uh, a good thing if it's a sort of big enough problem. Um, but um, so yeah, it's, through, it's basically through the analysis of uh, what's the mission and how impactful is the charity in terms of accomplishing that mission. Um, and GFI was set up as an EA charity. And so from the beginning, we have had a strategic plan. From the beginning, uh, we have had um, quarterly goals. We measure ourselves against the quarterly goals. We use the Google system, which is called um, objective and key result. Um, and then we have objective um, actions that feed into the key results, which feed into the objectives, which feed into our uh, North Star, which is essentially our mission statement. What are your goals for this year and then for 10 years? Um, so we have three programmatic areas, um, and each of our programmatic areas plus communications um, have a series um, of objectives, and then we have the key results that lead into the objectives. Um, but our objectives are established food businesses, embrace, develop, and promote um, plant-based and cellular agriculture, um, that there is an equal regulatory and government playing field for these alternative ways of producing animal products, that there is a strong ecosystem for both business and research uh, for the plant-based and cellular alternatives. Uh, GFI is the go-to partner and thought leader uh, in this space. Uh, and then our last objectives have to do with GFI being a satisfying and motivating place to work um, and that we have operate from a position of financial strength and security. So. And as you can tell, I have our objectives right here so I can never forget them. And uh, we evaluate like everything anybody wants to do um, at GFI, both the stuff we're actually doing um, need to be justified in terms of those six objectives. Um, and then if somebody proposes something, they need to write up um, an explanation for why it is the best thing that we could be doing. So we don't hold ourselves to, is that a good thing to be doing? We hold ourselves to, with our limited resources, is that the best thing we could be doing with both the, the time and the financial resources? Basically, Pareto principle. What uh, what made you decide to go the nonprofit versus the public benefit corp route? Talk me through your thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, it just uh, it felt to us like uh, the point at which you bring in um, any sort of uh, profit motive is the point at which you end up making decisions. Uh, in terms of profit motive rather than in terms of maximum impact. So, uh, for example, our science and technology department, uh, everything they do is focused on um, open sourcing the plant-based and cell ag 
um, science. So what happened with both of these technologies, with both the, the sort of plant-based meat technology and the clean meat technology, is we went from I have an idea to I have a company. So whether you're talking about Ethan Brown found, founding Beyond Meat or Pat Brown founding Impossible Foods or Uma Valetti or Mark Post uh, founding Memphis Meats and Mosa Meat, um, those guys had an idea, then they had a company, and all of their R&D is protected by intellectual property laws. Um, what GFI came along and did, um, until we came along, nobody had mapped the technological readiness of these technologies. Nobody had set out to say, what are the cr critical technology elements of these technologies? So, you know, what do we know? What are we clear that we don't know? What are the white spaces that need to be filled? Where are the areas where we need to be diving in, figuring out what we don't even know we don't know? Um, and just sort of what is the science from which this entire industry can build? Um, we are super enthusiastic about and supportive of the startups in this space and the corporations in this space, but we also need a base of science um, from which sort of all of this stuff can grow. And then similarly, another thing that GFI feels very, very strongly in, because I think it's true, um, is we don't want to disrupt the meat industry. We want to transform the meat industry. So we want JBS and Tyson and Purdue and Hormel and Smithfield. We want all of these companies um, doing R&D in this space, launching products, um, investing in startups, that sort of thing. And again, as a, as a public benefit corporation, it would be hard to figure, I mean, those are probably the two most important things um, are money into the science, um, especially from the public sector, um, that helps everyone. Um, and then the big food corporations, as well as the big um, tissue engineering corporations, the suppliers and the producers um, in that space for the, for the clean meat side. Um, and those are the two sort of probably, I don't know, we have a lot of very important goals, but those are right at the top of the list. Um, and they don't really fit into um, a public benefit corporation model. Makes sense. What percentage of people that are working in the clean meat space right now, would you say their primary motivation coming in was something to do with saving animals or fighting climate change? Just to get a, a basic ballpark, because I feel like it is much more one of the spaces that is fundamentally driven by important values rather than something else. Um, I mean, climate change uh, is pretty high on the list. Um, there are probably, I, I don't know what the percentage would be. Um, I think your overall point is accurate. Um, most of the people who have founded companies um, that are working on clean meat um, are doing it for impact. Um, certainly, um, Mark Post uh, and the other people at Mosa Meats are climate focused. I think most people are climate focused. Some people are animal focused. Some people are, how do we feed 9.7 billion people? So let's just produce meat more efficiently. Um, but I will just point out that um, the conventional meat industry um, has been investing in these companies. Um, Tyson has invested in multiple plant-based and cell-based meat companies. Um, Cargill has invested in both cell-based meat and plant protein supply for plant-based meat. Um, PHW Group, which is essentially the Tyson Foods of Germany, um, is invested in both the plant-based side and the cell-based side. Uh, and those companies are doing it for pure profitability. Um, they're not doing it for, for impact. They're doing it because um, if we're right that you can uh, produce exactly what people want, um, so you can give them everything they like about meat, but you can do it at a lower cost, um, it's going to be like you know the cell phone. So um, if we'd been having this conversation 25 years ago and we had been talking about, you know, we've been talking about, you know, I want to call my mom um, across town or across the world, we would need to you know pick up a phone and dial, and there would be a cord. Um, and now 99.9% .9 of communication, a lot of people still have the corded phones, uh, but 99.9% .9 of, of communication is either text message or cell phone. Um, similarly, if you had wanted to take a photo, um, you would have needed analog film 25 years ago. There were not that many digital cameras. And now 99.9% .9 of photographs are taken you know, with the, the camera in your pocket, um, which is also your phone. Um, and that is because in both of those cases, we gave people what they liked about communication, but a better way to do it. We gave people what they liked about taking pictures, but a better way to do it. Um, if we can give people what they like about meat, but for a, but for a lower cost, we're going to see just complete replacement. Yeah, it's like Henry Ford. The, the, T, the Model T comes around and we get rid of all the horses and poop in all the cities. It's, it's crazy. What technology or trend are you most excited about outside of your own field and why? 
Um, outside of this field, um, I'm pretty excited about autonomous cars. Um, I'm excited about autonomous cars um, because I'm not a fan of driving, um, and uh, and I like the and I am a fan of, of bicycling. Um, and I think autonomous cars, um, if I need to be in a vehicle, I like the idea of of sitting in the back seat um, and being in a uh, safer version of what happens now and then in a Lyft or an Uber. Um, and I like the idea of far fewer accidents. I like the idea of far less energy use. I like the idea of fewer people actually having to own cars. Um, there's a lot about autonomous vehicles that I think is, is, pretty, uh, is pretty exciting. Have you ridden in one? And if not, would you ride in one with your eyes closed today? I would absolutely ride in one with my eyes closed. I was, I was in Las Vegas um, and I was running late uh, to get to the airport. Um, and I, I punched in uh, Lyft and it asked me if I would accept an autonomous vehicle. And I seriously considered missing my flight uh, in order to be able to have that experience. Uh, but I ended up hopping in, a, you know, there was a line of cabs. Um, so I hopped in one of the cabs that there was a line of cab rather than uh, waiting for the autonomous Lyft. But um, I'm, I'm like that close to going back to Las Vegas just so that I can ride an autonomous vehicle. Worst case scenario, go steal a Tesla. That would be fun as well. I won't tell anyone that you did it. All right, thank you. It'll be our it'll be our secret. Our little secret. So, being around YC, you're around founders who are trying to change the world and dream and think bigger. What did you learn from all of these startup founders, all of these incredible people that you've taken with you? Um, I think um, grit is probably. Um, I mean, I, more and more people, I suppose, are, are talking about the idea um, of sort of perseverance. Um, but the, the difference between successful founders and unsuccessful founders, like um, you're oftentimes talking, I mean, you have, you have, uh, you have people who have the sort of um, chutzpah um, or self-confidence to start a company. So that's, you know, that's all of them. Um, most of these people tend to be pretty optimistic or they wouldn't have started the company. Um, most of these people tend to be pretty smart um, or they wouldn't have figured out how to start a company and they probably wouldn't have the self-confidence to start a company. Like there are a lot of qualities um, that are true of most people in the space. Um, but the people who are willing uh, to work, you know, 15, 16 hour days um, and maintain their optimism um, and um, yeah, they, they maintain their happiness like they're really just totally living, breathing in it. Um, that's the thing that I think makes for success. If I could give you a magic wand today to solve one big problem with the world, what would it be and how would you do it? Um, do I, can I, can I pick uh, plant-based meat and, uh, and clean meat? Because that's, uh, I'll, that's I'll, I'll give you that one and then we'll pick a second. All right. I would eliminate animal agriculture, uh, by accelerating the technological development of plant-based and clean meat. Um, so that it was it was already where we expect it to be in 10 years, where the, we have biomimics for all of the products, uh, and because they're so much more efficient, they cost less. Um, could, could we do was, that just with subsidies? So let's say, theoretically, farmers get a ton of subsidies, the, the transportation does. Could we literally just take climate change problematic subsidies and transfer them over to clean meat tech and suddenly have cost parity? Um, we could certainly create cost parity through significant subsidies. Um, they would have to be pretty significant. I mean, that, the market will solve this problem over time. Um, one of the things that governments should be doing is investing in this space, and that's one of the things that, that GFI is advocating. Uh, the first government to sink hundreds of millions of dollars into creating meat in this new way will have bragging rights for the rest of time as having been the government that really made this happen. Um, so too, you know, billionaire philanthropists like um, these technologies have gotten vanishingly little public and philanthropic money for open open source science. So um, government should be putting you know, putting some of the billions of dollars that they spend on global health and ag R and D um, into creating meat from plants and growing it directly from cells. Um, so that's one of the things that we're working on um, and that that could solve the problem. Uh, the second thing I would solve is just our broken educational system. I did Teach for America. I'm sure I could come up with a lot of other things, but the thing, um, Tim Ferriss has this question, um, if you were going to give a TED talk on something that's not in your zone, uh, what would it be? And mine would absolutely be uh, educational inequity. 
um, and the degree to which, you know, all the stuff I said earlier about um, charities not running like businesses, such that you can have a charity that does nothing useful and it will still raise millions of dollars every single year. Um, our educational system has just so colossally screwed up. Um, and in part, um, it's because of perverse incentives that keep it screwed up. Um, so I would wave a magic wand um, and require, well, I, mean, I would just improve the educational system. I also have some specific ideas for ways we could do that without a magic wand. Yeah, you could even just make it so your taxes go towards paying nationwide schools as opposed to having a serfdom where if you're in a poor neighborhood, you go to a poor school. If you're in a rich neighborhood, the school has more funding. That's yeah, I, I think that, that, would, uh, that would be one thing that would help. Um, I mean, I think actually, like, well, anyway, we could, this is a whole different podcast. It is a whole different podcast. And yet those are some of the fun things to talk about because everyone has expertise, but at the same time, you're around the most interesting people as well. So give me one incentive fix that you would fix right now for education. Um, so brand new teachers uh, would not be tossed into the pool and told to swim. Um, so, you know, I taught in inner city Baltimore um, and I taught through Teach for America, which is a program that I absolutely love. Um, I'm also a big fan, you know, despite being very progressive, I'm a big fan of charter schools um, and think that teacher unions um, are a lot like police unions. They're a big part of the problem. Um, and um, I mean, one of the things you, you could not imagine going to a Walmart um, and telling the greeter that there is like there are no resources for them. They should just well, it's not that there are no resources. It's go to the go to the web and figure out what you think is useful uh, to you as a greeter or as a cashier or you know the most um, you know sort of the most basic job. Um, and yet that's what teaching is. Um, certainly in the inner cities, and I'm told by others um, across the board. And teachers say, well, it's you know it's an art. Uh, it's an art. Um, and it's just it's just pathetic. Uh, the rationalizations from really smart people um, are just sad. Um, and we really need, if we take education seriously, um, if we take um, our children seriously, uh, we need to make sure that teachers are not tossed in the pool and told to swim in the way that happens, um, certainly in the inner city and I think across education in this country now. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. is something like 20 in the world now. It's, it's not a promising number and it's dropping. Yeah, no, and it's um, that, that's absolutely right. And and I was I was teacher of the year for my school the second year, um, and you know it was, I I enjoyed teaching and my students enjoyed me and it was great and I was you know successful um, for a second year teacher, uh, but the idea that anybody their second year in teaching um, would be teacher of the year for your for their school uh, is indicative of just like you know the the um, just how broken the system is. Yeah, there's a lot of things we need to fix. We've talked a bit about it on the podcast before. If you guys go to disruptors.fm and go to the education tab, you can find a whole lot more. I want to jump to the lightning round now. How's that sound, Bruce? Let's do it. I got two last questions for you. The first, what's something I should have asked you about but didn't? Fascinating. Seems, I mean, it's, I mean, there are lots of things we didn't talk about that are GFI related, but uh, nothing, nothing that seems like a, a significant um, oversight, Matt. What's the most exciting thing you've seen this past week? Um, probably the most exciting thing I've seen this lab. I mean, I, so we're um, so GFI um, in the last granting cycle. Uh, gave we have two donors who gave us three million dollars to do open so to sponsor open source science, um, two million dollars for plant based meat open source science, a million dollars for uh, cultivated meat open source science, um, and we just got uh, those two donors and then one more has joined them, uh, so we have close to five million dollars uh, this granting cycle uh, for open source cultivated science and I was reviewing our call for proposals and our plan for getting it into uh, as many hands as possible from tissue engineers and plant biologists and meat scientists uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, the 14 grants that we gave in the last granting round, I mean, we had a, we had a company and so it was mostly universities, but um, China and Europe and India. And I, I mean, I love that there's, there's one from Serbia 
Um, and uh, I imagine we're going to get even greater distribution and just the way that this sort of jump starts key scientists thinking about extending their talents to food, um, I find insanely exciting. Do you find the, the salaries and compensation to be less because people are more motivated by the work itself? Um, at the non, in the nonprofit space, um, I mean, I guess, I guess it depends on um, what sector you're looking at. So, um, I mean, I think the, the startups are basically paying startup salaries. Uh, the scientists who are working in universities were mostly, uh, were mostly bringing people over. So if they were tissue engineers working in therapeutics or um, meat scientists working on conventional meat, now they're working on plant-based or cell-based meat. Um, and that sort of thing. So I, I don't think the salaries change. Um, at the Good Food Institute, you know, we pay non-profit salaries, so people could be making um, a lot more money in the private sector, but we pay relatively well for a non-profit. Hence the excitement with uh, Incredible Burger, right? You can go get it at McDonald's and you're good to roll, or Burger King. Uh, yeah, the, the Impossible Burger. Impossible, uh, incredible, it, it is. But the thing is, there is an incredible burger, and it's made by Nestle. So, um, yeah, there's the uh, Impossible Burger by Impossible Foods, and you can get that in the United States at, at every Burger King in the country, the Impossible Whopper. Um, the Incredible Burger, I think, is just in Europe at this point, and it's made by Nestle. I find that a little weird. Food from Nestle, I don't know, it's, it rubs me the wrong way. It's like when you see those list of product fails, and you see like the mac and cheese company that tries to make toothpaste or something. It just doesn't quite line up brand centrically, at least in my mind. Uh, that, that's interesting. Um, I did not have that preconception. I'm uh, I'm generally pretty excited when any oh, I'm uh, excited. Sort of major food conglomerate goes in that direction. I'm excited. I want one last thing from you. It can be a quote, a call to action, anything before you tell people about more about you and where to find you. Um, I would, I mean, I would challenge people to really like when you're thinking about what you want to do in the world, um, think about what happens if you don't do it. Um, so occasionally people will say, well, I want to go work for a nonprofit organization and subsidies for animal agriculture are a big problem. So I'm going to fight subsidies for animal agriculture. Um, and I've actually had that conversation with a few different people. Um, and I remind them that um, Barack Obama opposed subsidies for animal agriculture. Uh, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, both George Bushes. Um, so do you think you are going to be more effective than you know the last however many presidents? Um, so challenge yourself not just to ask, is this something that if I accomplished it, it would be awesome? Uh, but you know, really do say, is it important? Is it neglected? And is it tractable? How likely am I to be successful? Um, so there's uh, an EA organization that focuses on vocations. It's called 80,000 Hours, um, because 80,000 hours is about how much time you will spend in your lifetime working. Um, and they do um, counseling for people. They will brainstorm with you. They have a phenomenal podcast. Um, so really think about what you're going to do with your life um, and try to do something that if you didn't do it, it either wouldn't happen or at least that it wouldn't happen as well as, uh, as you doing it basically make a difference. Yeah, 80,000 hours. They're great. We're going to have Rob on the program. And on the second podcast, which I've told you guys about in the past, the roundup where we have the best podcasts from around the web, we find all the best ones and curate them for you guys. It's at rounduppodcast.com. We're going to have them on there as well, because it is incredibly important what they're doing. Yep. Yeah, that's my that's my call to action. Make your uh, make your life meaningful and, and really, really think through strategically um, how you're going to spend your time. Exactly. It's all up to you. Bruce, thanks for coming on. Where can people find you learn more? Uh, GFI.org uh, is our website. Uh, GFI.org up slash essentials is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, and GFI.org up slash video uh, if you want the essentials that you would rather uh, listen or watch than read. Awesome. Thanks for coming on today, Bruce. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks so much, Matt. It was my pleasure. Sweet. Cheers. We will talk to you guys again soon.